Okay. Uh, two apologies. First, from uh, Ayala Chavit, who um, wishes to uh, wish to wish to be here, but she needs to be with her son or daughter uh, at medical checkups, so she couldn't uh, came to this uh, session or to the conference at all. And uh, uh, second, apologies for the inconvenience of uh, this morning. Um, we'll try to keep uh, the timetable as scheduled. So um, it is honor to oh, here you are <laughs> uh, to welcome uh, Frederick, uh, who is a researcher at the Laboratory of Social Anthropology and director of the research de department of the Quai Branly Museum in Paris. After studying philosophy at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley, he has been researcher, uh, researching the history of anthropology and contemporary biopolitical questions. He published Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, Une introduction, uh, Lucien lévi Brul Entre philosophie et anthropologie, uh, Une monde grippé, he has co-edited with uh, VLS Des Hommes Mal Malades et Animaux. And uh, today he will speak about Sentinels of the Environment, Bird Watching at Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Yossi Leshem, who will, I will introduce uh, more broadly later, will be the commentator. And I uh, gladly will give the floor to uh, Professor Keck. Just let's see that now it's working, OK. But here you go. F5 should be. Okay, so I want to thank Andy for the opportunity to continue the conversation we've had on the biopolitics of human, non human relationship, also with Johanna and Etienne, and for and thanking Shai for the opportunity to open a conversation uh, with you all, and I particularly thank the commentator for the discussion. Um, the, the paper I, I sent is a, a paper on the press about um, a long field work that, that I've done in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, but I want to give you the context, and the material c could be expanded to something bigger than, than the article that is published in a, a, a journal called China's Perspectives, which is a a journal of, of Chinese studies. Um, since I am now working in a museum, and we will talk about museums tomorrow, and the relations between muse museums and zoos as spaces of preservation of, of non-human life, uh, the Musée du Quai Branly has uh, opened 10 years ago, has received the collections of the Musée de l'Homme. Uh, and part of the collections are particularly uh, uh, constituted of feathers, it was the collections of the royal cabinets, feathers that have been here in the collection for 400 years. And so there are many questions of restor restoration and preservation. And if you read the history of bird watching uh, activities, one of the uh, historical roots of bird watching is the, so, so of course there is the, the, the industrial shift and the rediscovery of natural landscapes in, in Britain, but there was also the massive import of objects containing feathers uh, from Oceania on one side and from America on the, other, on the other side. And so the idea of comparing the diversity of, of feathers uh, and, and, and the ornaments of birds uh, gave rise to the idea of uh, ornithology. So there is this link between ornithology and anthropology. And the Musée de Camorlin is also a place where they, it's also, it's also a garden. And in this garden, there are ducks. Uh, and recently, there have been six ducks dying in a row, and there was suspicion of, uh, of poisoning. Uh, and so that may be one of the reasons why they hired an anthropologist who had worked previously on avian flu uh, 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 to be a kind of expert. But so my, I'm broadening my, now my res research on biopolitics of avian flu to a more general reflection on the preservation of bird life in places like museums and zoos. Uh, my theoretical background is uh, 
uh, as Agai mentioned, uh, French anthropology, uh, Lucien Levy Brühl and Claude Levi Strauss. Uh, and the, the, the theoretical question I raised in my PhD was really to think about symbolism without sacrifice. And this resonates with some of the papers that we will see tomorrow. Uh, how, how animals are considered as, as symbols that give meaning to life uh, uh, in times that are not times of major collective uh, uh, effervescence, as Durkheim would say, which are sacrifice. Uh, looking at ordinary life, looking at times of um, uh, loss, um, and, and so there was this, um, so it, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a questioning about identification and mental representations of, uh, of uh, non-humans by humans. But there was this uh, idea of Levi Brühl that uh, birds are particularly endowed with um, supernatural powers because of the, of the colorfulness of their feathers. So you see, th th that was uh, the, the, the enigma of uh, a, a, a tribe in, in South America pretending to be uh, parrots, araras. Uh, and, and, and so th there was the question of why and in what occasions these birds were considered as uh, symbols of the identity of, of, the, of the human tribe. But then Claude Lévi-Strauss was uh, uh, moving a bit further than Levi Brühl into ordinary life, uh, saying that sacrifice is only one moment in social life, but there are many other opportunities where uh, uh, animals become meaningful to humans. And among, among animals, he said, birds are particularly meaningful berries because it's, uh, the, 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 num the number of species is, is small enough uh, to allow for comparison and, and big enough to move from the mammals um, uh, that uh, shape the, the daily environment. Uh, so they, they, they're kind of intermediary means of communication with the, with the environment. And, and in, in the question of um, why are we emotionally engaged to animals, levi source also focused on the perception of signs. Uh, so uh, uh, animals, and particularly birds, sense signs uh, of uh, the environment, uh, signs uh, of the, the enclosure, but also the, the, the threatened environment, and signs of events that can change the social classifications. Um, and so we, we, with Andy, we, we try to uh, develop this idea with the, the contemporary notion of sentinel devices, uh, and we try to make a distinction between different ways to use uh, non-humans with technologies to sense signs of, of the future. And uh, by distinction with all these figures um, uh, in the, that, that correspond to different steps in the history of, of, of human rationalities of, of the future, uh, we, we thought that Sentinel was particularly interesting to think about uh, borders. Uh, so borders between humans and animals, um, but also uh, borders between territories. Uh, and so a sentinel is, is a, is a non-human figure that is equipped uh, to send signals on, on a border where future threats emerge and become visible. Um, and I think, I guess we were particularly interested by this notion of the sentinel because it connects uh, um, the uh, health politics and military politics, uh, which give its uh, interest to the notion of biosecurity. Uh, so Sentinel is a, is, is, a, is a military post at the border where environmental threats emerge. Uh, and it's also, if, if, if I go back to this genealogy of French anthropology, Sentinel is a, is a, is a place where signs are particularly uh, uh, intense. So there is this idea of sentier, uh, perceive. Uh, it's a, a place where perception becomes more uh, intense and meaningful. So based on this, uh, um, all this background, I want to, to just to say how I, I started to work on bird watchers. So I, I did a kind of uh, uh, extensive mapping, uh, structuralist mapping of all the actors who were involved in the management of uh, the risk of uh, pandemic flu in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong being the place where um, uh, avian influenza uh, was threatening to transform into pandemic influenza uh, since the emergence of the H5N1 virus in 1997. And as most um, citizens and readers of uh, the news, I was struck by the massive uh, culling of uh, poultry, when, which is a regular event in Hong Kong. 
uh, when there is H5N1 in markets or farms or at the border. Uh, but I wanted to go uh, beyond this image of uh, killing domestic uh, birds. Uh, so this is the, the kind of uh, vertical arrow. Uh, this is a, a, a framework that I borrowed to Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, Savage Mind, adapting it to contemporary actors of um, risk management in Hong Kong. So, so I was uh, interested to see how um, if, if you um, do, you don't only look at the vertical arrow that uh, explains the uh, perception of a mutant virus, how a mutant right. virus transforms into uh, uh, or occasions uh, a massive killing of chickens. And this is uh, explained by the decision of uh, microbiologists and, uh, um, and veterinarians, physicians, how all this administration of human health, animal health combines together uh, to um, make the decision for, for a killing. But I was interested to see how beyond this massive killing, there were all kinds of local attachment to birds. And uh, that could be from uh, um, uh, people in ordinary people, like there were Buddhist uh, practitioners who would release birds and um, discovered that there was a risk of, uh, for the birds to, to be sick. Uh, and, and these practitioners would, be, would see more bird as a commodity, but discovering that birds also uh, were living beings, uh, kind of taking their revenge against, uh, uh, against humans. And uh, on the other side, all the people who were uh, interacting on an ordinary basis with uh, birds, uh, farmers, but also uh, bird watchers. And after doing a lot, many interviews with um, people in the administration of risk of avian flu, uh, I uh, started to hang, hang on mostly with bird watchers who had more time uh, to show me their uh, reserves and, um, and, and, and go on boats to see shorebirds. Uh, so I started to write a kind of history of uh, bird watching societies in Hong Kong. And I became interested to compare it with another territory that plays almost the same role in, in relation to China, which is Taiwan. And in a kind of, of a, a very ambitious project, I, I, I would like to compare it to Japan or Singapore or uh, Philippines, Australia, because all this uh, the bird watching activity in Hong Kong and Taiwan is related to the idea of a, of an, a flyway uh, going from the north, from, from Japan to Australia. Uh, where there are around 500 uh, species uh, that uh, roost on different uh, spaces uh, along, along the uh, South China Sea. Um, but the question I had in mind when I did this, um, this research was, um, uh, does a threatened bird have the same meaning in Taiwan and in Hong Kong? So one of the, question, one of the answers was to say, uh, no, because there are two different post-colonial histories uh, of birdwatching activities in, in these two territories. Uh, the um, Hong Kong model is based on <coughs> uh, the, the British uh, uh, training and, and the uh, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds is, is, is the biggest environmental uh, uh, protection um, uh, association in the world with one million members. 1.1. Uh, one. So it's increasing. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Taiwan is based on the American model uh, with the Audubon Society. So, and in this uh, different training uh, would um, explain a difference in the perception of uh, a threatened species. Uh, so <coughs> uh, Hong Kong would focus more on uh, the first scene because it's a, it's a place for migratory observation of migratory birds. Uh, and there is the tradition of knowing lo your local patch so when, there, uh, uh, when a new species arrives, uh, you, 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 you note it, uh, and, and other uh, bird watchers come to see it and confirm its arrival on the territory. Um, uh, whereas in Taiwan, there is more focus on the endemic species, uh, because Taiwan uh, uh, is an island with forests, uh, a long aboriginal history. Uh, so there is this idea that there are around 35 species that are you can see only in Taiwan uh, and that have an ecological but also a tourism value uh, because you can bring bird watchers from all over the world to see these birds only in Taiwan. Um, and this different in 
post-colonial history and in ecological uh, perception of the birds explains that um, in, so I studied particularly uh, a controversy, uh, a mobilization that happened in Taiwan and Hong Kong at the same time around 2000. And I want very briefly uh, in five minutes uh, to say how uh, the, the two societies came to work together, uh, exchange competencies, but at the same time, uh, the, the, the mobilization wa didn't find the same outcome in the two um, territories. So um, the, in, in Hong Kong, um, uh, the, it's, it's a history of, of uh, indigenization in both territories. Uh, it, it, so so um, I, uh, it confirms the idea of a sentinel because it's a history of a military practice that becomes an ecological practice. Um, so the, the, uh, the, 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 mo the best place for uh, observation of birds in Hong Kong is Maipo, which is at the, at the end of the Pearl River Delta. And it was a place where British officers would observe the arrival of refugees from China. And so as you can see behind these birds, you see the towers of Shenzhen now. Uh, so it's still a place where you can uh, uh, look at the uh, threats coming from China. No, it's not, it's not refugees bearing signs of uh, political reforms in the continent, but more birds with signs of um, environmental threats such as uh, avian flu. And there are many activities in this, uh, in this society that are borrowed to uh, um, uh, the British model, such as bird races, where uh, uh, all the members would um, go in different locations of, of the territory and, and see as many birds as possible. And there's a whole economy of trust uh, between uh, the groups uh, to uh, actually um, sh check that they've really seen this, the, the species they, they said they, 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 they would see. Um, and so after 1997, the end of um, Hong Kong to China, uh, the Hong Kong birdwatching societies became uh, predominantly Chinese and the, their major uh, success was uh, the protection of um, an agricultural land against a construction project. Uh, so Long Valley, which uh, doesn't look very fancy. So Maipo, the Maipo marshes is protected by the World Wildlife Fund uh, since uh, colonial times. Uh, but this uh, agricultural land, which is also on the border with uh, Shenzhen, uh, they discovered that there were 200 uh, species living only on this um, uh, um, uh, rice paddy, and the bird watchers started to uh, defend the territory against um, uh, the uh, Kowloon Canton Railway Company, which is a very influential uh, uh, lobby. Uh, and they succeeded thanks to a, a, a big campaign of emailing and letters and sending pictures of, of the land. And so is the idea that birds were uh, uh, winning against uh, the, the machines. And these are the black-faced spoonbill, which is one of the endangered uh, species in, in, in Asia. Um, and at the same time, in 2000, there was a similar movement happening in Taiwan, uh, in Hubei, so uh, close to Taichung, in the middle of the, of the island. Uh, and it was a, um, so this time it was uh, uh, the, the villagers who started the movement, not the bird watchers. But then the bird watchers became involved because they discovered that it was a very nice uh, species called the fairy pita. Uh, so it's, it's very fancy, it has a lot of colors, and when it uh, flies, it, it looks like a fairy because it glimmers. Um, and uh, the bird watchers showed that uh, the fairy pita was an endemic species uh, that was under threat. Um, and, they, and, and that was the time of uh, political uh, change. Uh, the Democratic uh, Party won the election, and President Ch Cheng Shui Bian uh, declared the fairy pita one of the emblems of, uh, tai of Taiwan. And, uh, and in Taipei, you, you can also see these uh, uh, images of, of birds on the pavement around the presidential palace. So uh, the Hubert village was turned into an echo village. Uh, there was the statue of the fairy pita. But it, it's interesting to see that in the following years, uh, the Endemic Species Research Institute uh, made an extensive survey of fairy pitas in the territory and discovered that there were fairy pitas, fairy pitas all over Taiwan. Uh, so it was not a threatened species. 
uh, and that um, the, the threat to the species actually came from Borneo, which was the place where they uh, uh, migrated uh, because of deforestation. So they, the ornithology, uh, ornithologists uh, said the, the, the blame is not on the construction practices in Taiwan, but more on, on global practices of wood uh, economy in, in Indonesia. And after this study, uh, the, the dam that uh, the villagers were fighting against was actually built. So it's a, it's a movement that failed because it was focused on only one specie, species. Um, whereas the Long Valley movement was not on the defense of one species, but the defense of a whole environment where villagers and bird watchers were working together uh, in, a, in a long time process. So bird watchers are also going there to cultivate the rice paddies. So, so um, there are many information in the paper, but I w want really to, to focus on this, the, com the comparison between the success and the failure of these two movements. And so it's, it, there's, a veil, there's a very similar process in the indigenization of birdwatching practices in, in Taiwan. Um, uh, th it's first uh, uh, an American practice, and uh, it's also a military practice. So there was a, a project of um, a migratory animal pathological survey uh, that was carried from uh, Japan to Thailand with uh, birds banded uh, all over uh, the flyway uh, and, and the, the data reported to uh, the different collecting centers. Uh, and, and thanks to this um, survey, uh, uh, bird watchers were trained to bend. And first it was a job to get money and then it became a leisure uh, at the end of the military regime of Chiang Kai-shek because before uh, the end of the military regime, only the Westerners were allowed to wear binoculars uh, in the island because you could be accused of being a spy. Uh, and, uh, and free associations were um, uh, prohibited. And then there was an explosion of um, associations in protection of nature and, and there were many bird clubs and a very complex federal system uh, of um, bird societies um, and the Taipei Bird Club is, is of course, the, the biggest bird club. Uh, there was also um, an, uh, an indig indigenization of um, uh, bird books and uh, bird collecting practices. Uh, this is uh, John Wusun Song, uh, who was one of the first um, bird watchers in, in Taiwan. Um, he was trained as an engineer in uh, Austria. And so he was very good at, at uh, uh, taxidermy, uh, at um, uh, uh, looking at the physio physiology of, of birds. Uh, and then he became uh, involved in the defense of the gray-faced gray buzzard. Uh, and he was involved in that by Japanese uh, bird watchers, because bird watching started in Japan in 1930s with interesting Buddhist um, uh, influences. And so he, he turned from collecting specimens uh, to uh, uh, bird watching, uh, and he allied with uh, a Japanese um, uh, painter uh, to portray birds. And it, most of the bird watchers I've met said this was the first uh, bird book they've had, uh, and they were very proud to have that because it was not based on the Western representation of birds. So the the, the Western representation of birds is the Peterson model uh, of having the, the birds of the same species. Um, with a, sh uh, with a form that uh, uh, facilitates identification. Whereas here you have uh, the birds are portrayed in their ecologies and uh, they are captured in their most beautiful movements, so often flying. Uh, so so there, is, um, th there is also a, 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 a kind of indigenization of the images of birds themselves. Uh, but as in the West, there is this movement of from hunting to observing and, and painting. And now uh, there are, um, there's a, a, a massive trend toward um, uh, di digitalization of um, uh, bird watching practices. So um, with uh, digital cameras, people can uh, take pictures of birds and send these pictures on the, the website of the societies. And this gives rise to very interesting controversies uh, between professionals mostly Western and amateurs, mostly Chinese, rich Chinese, who can buy these um, cameras, uh, about uh, is an, what is the worth of an image? Uh, is the, is the, the image of a bird, of a bird 
uh, does it have value if it doesn't give information about uh, the species, the localization? Uh, and the website is a way to uh, raise these uh, questions and also share information. And, and some argue that, that these amateurs are uh, destroying the, the value of, of, the, um, of, the, of the network. Uh, and others say that it's good for the uh, environment that all these uh, amateurs become involved and that sometimes a picture without identification allows a professional bird watcher or a serious bird watcher to find the bird in the location. Um, and this is the final uh, slide. Um, so coming back to this um, controversy, to the, to, the, to the comparison between these two movements in 2000 uh, uh, and, and the theoretical background I explained, I, I, I was interested in the, uh, in the reflection on, on flagship species, which is a vocabulary of, of uh, bird washers and, and vital movement. That is a species that carries um, uh, uh, citizens to care for um, a, a species and engage themselves in the defense of a species, uh, which is a, a way to talk about the symbol in a, in a classical anthropological way. Uh, and so the, the, the argument I want to make with sentinel territories is that um, a, a species is not enough in itself, but the species becomes meaningful in the territory, uh, w in a border with um, um, not, not only human and non-human, but also um, between the territory and, and a bigger territory where, where the which is the, the space of imagination of threat. Um, and so the, uh, between Taiwan and Hong Kong, which both have this complicated relation to, to China, uh, the, the way they would become sentinel territories depends on the way they would uh, attach themselves to these flagship species and, and build a collective uh, in the defense of the environment. That is what, what, we, what I call a sentinel collective. Okay. As a commentator, Professor Yossi Leshem, who is a senior researcher in the Department of Zoology at the Faculty of Life Sciences in Tel Aviv University, and is the founder and director of the International Center for the Study of Bird Migration at Latrun, Israel. He also worked on the Soci Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel, the SPNI, and uh, a leading NGO in Israel as a, an executive uh, director of this uh, um, society between uh, 91 and 95. Uh, Professor Leshem published three books, scientific papers, and hundreds of articles in popular magazines. Uh, he visited Japan as a visiting uh, professor at the University of Tokyo, and uh, uh, he is a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Environment Protection in 2008. So it's a great uh, pleasure to have us uh, to have you with us, and please uh, the floor uh, is thank yours. You, uh, thank you for inviting me. When uh, Guy invited Hagai. me, well, sorry, when Hagai invited me. I wasn't sure, I was, I'm really busy with other issues now. I said, ah, why should I come to a field which I'm not, it's not really my field. Mm -hmm. I never heard about Professor Heck, so <laughs> I said, maybe I, that's not my place. But then, he, I don't know if you know the item in Hebrew, Nudnik, it's in Yiddish, you know, someone who never leaves you, he picks you all the time. So he came back to me and then I saw the title. <laughs> so, and when I saw the, the title of the lecture, I got excited. And then I read the paper and I got more excited. Why? Because, and that's what, what I want to follow uh, your presentation, Frederick. I am an ontologist or bird watcher. You know, these are two different items which I don't get into it now because time is limited. But in 1998, I was invited by the president of Taiwan uh, with a team of 80 uh, people from about uh, 60 countries. And that was the time, as exactly you said, there was a total change in the mind of the government of uh, tai uh, Taiwan. And they decided instead of, you know, before it, like in China, uh, they were slaughtering everything which was moving across the birds. And at that decade, they decided to start a movement of uh, conservation as exactly as you said. And to give a, a real uh, a public awareness to the idea, the, the biggest organization in the world is called BirdLife International. It's an umbrella organization. In Israel and by NGOs, they have a, with all the members, they have about six million members, 
and uh, Israel, the SPNI, is the, the, the member of BirdLife. So I was invited. This was 1998. You see, I'm standing here when I still had dark hairs many years ago. And the bottom line was that uh, the, after we met the president, we went to the mayor of Taipei. His name was Professor Ma. He is a professor of law, and he was the mayor of Taipei. And uh, when we came there, I, I just had a big poster of Stokes over Jerusalem. And in Bangkok, where you can make everything in 20 minutes, I framed for the president and for him a, a picture. And when we came there, no one gave a present, only myself, in the name of Israel. And he got really excited. And he called me aside and said, this next year I'm coming to Israel. Maybe I can, he's not, he had to do nothing with uh, bird watching. So I said, you'll be most welcome to my center. And in, I have in Latour Nevada. And he was 11 days in Israel. At the end of the visit, uh, when he came to my center, I put the flag of Taiwan and the flag of Israel. And he got really moved. He told me, listen, Yossi, I'm 11 years. I was with several ministers. And I was in, in, in the universities. I was everywhere. Everyone was putting Taiwan under the carpet because the problems of China. You are the first one who had the courage to put up. I told him, I'm in Tel Aviv University. I'm not in politics. I don't care. Even it's a bit sensitive because our rector, Professor Aron Shai, he is an expert of Chinese. But of course, I, I'm not working for him. I'm working for my activities. And the bottom line was that he was so excited. And of course, we showed him what we are doing. That is uh, Professor Ma. I gave him a book that I wrote, which is called Flying with the Birds. Why I'm showing you the book? Because I did my PhD with the Israeli Air Force. And when you are talking on the flyways of, uh, of the Eastern Asia, our flyways is on a much bigger scale because we are bottleneck in three continents. We have about one billion birds on the migration. So for bird lovers, this is heaven. But for the Israeli Air Force, again, because of the political situation, disaster. And they lost, and it's a, a, a whole story. So uh, uh, after I, he, I hosted him, uh, one day later, he invited me to come again to Taiwan. And uh, I, I couldn't come, but a year later I came. And he was nominated as the president of Taiwan. And we became close friends because he liked my carriage with the flag. The only story was the flag. Mm -hmm. And I told him that our, our slogan, I'm doing a lot of activity with the Jordanian and Palestinian under the title, Migrating Beds, No No Boundaries. So I think it's also a very str strong political message. And I think that's exactly as you said. Birds are a tool because they are flying, and you know, in Hebrew you have an item, the soul of the bird, or something like that, and tipora nefesh then it's easy to use the bird as a tool not only for pure science. And that's what we are trying to do here, a part of the pure science that we are doing. And uh, when I came, this was the second time he was uh, voted as the president of Taiwan. And I, I, I just took a few slides because is, right now there is a big conference in the university with 30 professors from Taiwan. The, the one who is hosting is our faculty of life sciences. And I got really crazy because they brought 30 professors, and they are talking only on biomed. They have Tamar Dayan, they have me, they have many others. Instead of spending at least half a day on uh, biodiversity, they are just talking on biomed, which is fair enough. Now, the ambassador, ours, and our ambassador, they know my relations. They forgot to, to put us in. So on Wednesday, when you are going to the biblical zoo, all these professors are coming. We have a station of bending birds or ringing birds. You know, it depends. If you are from Hong Kong, you say uh, ringing, like Britain. And if you're in Taiwan, they say bending, like the States, uh, as you said. So we have a station on the land of the Knesset where we are catching migrating birds. We did it on a system that the public can come and see what we are doing. And about 50,000 students are coming every year to see it. As far as I know, this is the only parliament in the world that have a bending station on its land. So I tried to convince the president, because they have much bigger gardens there, to do the same. So maybe they do it. And the bottom line was that in this ceremony, I was the official guest of him. So when I came there, and about 90 delegations, I just want to show again the power of the birds. I'm not talking now on birds. But following what you are saying, I had two hours with him. He brought three ministers. On, see, I'm standing near him. That's the president. This is our ambassador. She's now in the university. And I don't talk to her because I got mad. She didn't talk on biodiversity in this meeting. But she's coming, of course, I'm joking, she's coming. But on the right side is the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Defense, and the Minister of Education. And after this meeting, they saw that he is a close friend of mine. Then they took me to the Air Force, because they knew my study was the Air Force. So this is the commander of the Air Force, who became now the Minister of Defense. 
and now I got three hundred thousand dollars to make a joint venture with them. And he to he told me that his deputy is a general in the air force, is an F-16 pilot. He told me, you know what's his hobby? I said probably bird bird watching. He said exactly. So I brought him to Israel, and now. Uh, we had, you see, we took, we took him for a week tour in Israel to learn about our birds and to do everything. And this is our former ambassador. And the bottom line is that last year we brought the Minister of Agriculture. We took him in the field and to learn our birds. And uh, when we had the dinner with our Minister of Agriculture at that time, uh, Yair Shamir, the first thing when I came after a day with him in the field. He already told me, Yossi, we are going to make, I have a big project using barn owls as pest control agents in agricultural fields to reduce the use of pesticides. So when I was invited to the dinner because they took him in the field, and Mr. Shamir told me, Yossi, what have you done to the Taiwanese minister? I told him, what have I done? I, it looked to me, he was in it with a big delegation. He's talking only on barn owls. That's, it, it became the most important issue. I said, good, so I did my job. So now they also uh, gave us the funds and when we, I took him to an oriental restaurant, and last year he hosted me, and our ambassador, you know, there is a pita bread, you know, the Arab bread. The ambassador made him the pita bread, and that, that's what we did. So what I wanted to say, the bottom line, what's the vision of our work? I always like to show the slide. You see President Bush standing like a bear there, but he forgot to remove the cover of the binocular. <laughs> so when you're talking now, what's the vision of what you are talking and I'm talking? And when I got this picture, I was really worried. I went to the state. Can I show them the president, my stupid guy? So it happened also to our Minister of Defense, as you can see. <laughs> so my message after you talk, I think that bird watching is indeed a, a very strong. If you look, I don't know if you're aware, but the economist made a study. I mean, you probably know it. There are now 100 million bird watchers all over the world. In the States, it became hobby number three. And Taiwan made a real move. I don't know Hong Kong at all, but Taiwan became a very active uh, community of birders and it's with farmers. So we are now trying to implement the story of what we did here with the Palestinian and Jordanian. And we believe this is something which can get, at least if you're talking on peace treaty, this is something which takes people together. And on Wednesday at the uh, afternoon, I, I come, you know, that peace treaty with Jordan happened 20 years ago in October 1994. And it wa they wanted to make a big event with 20 generals from Jordan and 20 generals from Israel. Unfortunately, there was, the, the, again, the conflict in Gaza, and the ambassador of Jordan went back to Jordan, so they canceled it. But they're coming this week. So on Wednesday, all these generals are meeting for two and a half days, talking on uh, political and army projects. Mm -hmm. I am fortunate to be the only one who talks for 45 minutes on belts, no, no boundaries, because they understood again. And not only that, we have now a big, and with that I'll finish, we have now a big project. With, we got a, 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 a high-tech guy who gave us uh, 15 million shekels for making project with the army. So every commander in the army who makes a project for nature protection, not only in bed, gets 100,000 shekels. So we went to the chief of staff, he got excited, and last week on, on, man, uh, on Monday, we had in the headquarters of the IDF, we put uh, ammunition boxes for SWIFTs. We have SWIFTs who are summering in Israel. Uh, we put 28 first boxes, all of them for ammunition boxes, and the chief of staff with 20 generals from the board were standing there and releasing the SWIFTs. And some people said, this looks bizarre, you know, they uh, had a huge training, and suddenly they stopped everything and they came for one hour to release SWIFTs. But I told the chief of staff, if you come with all your board, and in the middle of a big maneuver, you release swifts and you show everyone that, and it's in the media, then people understanding you are taking serious the, the biodiversity, because the army, as you probably know, it's a huge army in Israel, and they are making the biggest damage to the environment. So if you get the chief of staff and his officers, and if you're starting from the top, it will be a success story. And we have also the money for it, so then we are done. So we have to work on it. So I think all the issue of bird watching is not just a nice hobby for many people to run and enjoy the birds. I think it has the power to get the people as flag species, and I think that's the most important. And I had always conversation with Tamar. I'm talking only on different vultures. And Tamar always said, listen, there are also insects and butterflies and fish, and you are talking most of the time of flag species. And I agree, because I think through that, 
In the Hula Valley, we are protecting cranes, which are not an endangered species, common crane. But because they protected the area, now we have several species like Imperial Eagle and Greater Spotted Eagle, which are one of the most important world sites for protecting wintering eagles. Mm -hmm. So the whole story is not just uh, that. So I think, the, I hope we'll have time to meet because I, time is squeezed, but I think that this lecture mm -hmm. was excellent. Maybe we invite you now again, this time not for this cycle, mm -hmm. but for the birders who are coming. Once a year we have here a lecture day in Small House, which is the biggest hall, and we have 1,200 people coming to a lecture day. Mm -hmm. So in Israel it's a big story now, and we are trying to get Taiwan connected because they have a lot of money and they are keen on building. So it's a good community. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Yossi. So uh, let's try to frame this in the concepts of biopolitics and uh, the uh, central line between life sciences and social and political sciences. Um, David. Please. I have a question of uh, more of clarification than any a comment because uh, I, I wasn't sure I really understood the way biodiversity and biosecurity can be combined into one project. I mean, what, how can people who treat birds as a source of threat uh, cooperate or do the same job as those who believe that they are the victims of, uh, of, of threat, of being threatened. So, uh, and I suppose that would affect also historically the way of organization, as you mentioned in your paper, of how these associations were created. So I understood well the, the, mo the military model, but I couldn't see how it could be combined with the motivation of other people, you know, standard bird watchers who are uh, attracted by, not as sentinels, in words not as sentinels, but rather the, mm -hmm. as objects of mm -hmm. beauty or biodiversity or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer or should we take some more? I can take a range of questions. Okay, is there, yes, at the end. who 
who actually managed to contribute and to influence the direction of the banding program on a very high level. And so to me, there's a way in which that is, is very democratic. It's not, it's not uh, popular, right? It's not a vast thing. We're talking about a couple thousand people. Um, but it's kind of non-professionals, not involved in the government, coming from all different places across the country who are able to make a real difference in the way that the banding program works and make real scientific contributions. When you look at citizen science today, it's much more vastly distributed, right? Um, you have people who have easy access to cameras and to bird, bird guides and can get online and can contribute their data, but they have much, much less influence over the way that that data gets used or interpreted or the structure of the scientific program as a whole. So even as the um, bird watching, kind of bird engagement with birds in general has become democratized in the sense of being popularized, spread throughout the population, um, the amount of influence that those people actually have over the kind of science that is being done has, I think, shrunk considerably. So that now they're essentially being used as data sources. Like, mm -hmm. they, you know, people have affective engagements with nature that can be exploited by professionals to produce new kinds of data. And that seems to be much less democratic. Than so to me, I, have this, I think there's lots of other stuff going on too. There's interesting pockets of, of influence. But to me, um, in the, at least in the US case, there's a story of popularization linked to a kind of de-democratization mm. of, of the science itself. And I just wonder if we could balance that against the Taiwanese and mm -hmm. Hong Kong cases. OK. Do you want to answer that, uh, David and Etienne? And then we'll take another round. Yeah. OK. okay. Um, yeah, maybe also I would react to yes, Yossi's sure. uh, very sure. generous, uh, exciting comment uh, because it confirms the idea of a military genealogy of um, bird watching uh, and uh, actually one of my theoretical uh, uh, simulations was the work of Amot Zahavi, uh, the handicap principle which is one of the founders of uh, Australian ornithology uh, as he, <coughs> he was working in the Negev desert about uh, these birds that have sentinel behaviors uh, and that uh, send what he calls costly, costly signals of uh, the approach of a predator. And, and it's a whole discussion within <coughs> evolutionary bio biology uh, about uh, the role of sentinel birds. Uh, are they sac sacrificing for the sake of the species? Or are they uh, defending their own worth as an individual in a kind of communication with the predator? And I, I'm, I'm I think that the, the idea of, of a costly signal sent by the bird really gives agency to the bird in, in contrast with the idea of a sacrifice of the sentinel for the sake of uh, the species or for... And, and actually that's also the way I, I encountered this uh, link between bio biodiversity and biosecurity because um, for avian influenza they are sentinel chickens and they are uh, chickens that uh, are unvaccinated in a farm and they die first at uh, the emergence of a, a flu virus in the farm. So they are really sacrificed for the sake of the farm but most mostly of the humans who are threatened by H5N1. Uh, and then I realized that the bird watchers were uh, transforming this logic of sacrifice and saying we are interested in the birds by themselves and uh, if uh, we have been monitoring birds for a long time and so we we can we can see if there's a decline in number of birds if they uh, if they can if they carry viruses uh, and um, they, they 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 started to say that avian flu was not a threat only for humans but also also for birds themselves uh, and that the birds could also carry signals of threats for other um, uh, uh, carries uh, no they, they, that the birds could carry signals of other threats such as um, nuclear radiations or climate change, and that monitoring birds was a way to... Um, lead poisoning. Lead poisoning. Uh, so monitoring birds was a way to um, uh, s send signals of threats at different uh, temporalities, not only short-time pandemic, but also long-time climate change. Um, and so that's how birds were not only considered as source of threat, but also as threatened species. And that's also the ambivalence of H5N1, how, they, that, that, how it reveals that um, the same bird is, a, is, a, is, is threatening and threatened. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the idea of sentinel, where a common threat affects humans and animals. So 
Animals can be used as, um, as tools to protect against the threat, but also as allies, because they are also affected by the threat. And then um, on the question of well, yeah, nationalism, trust nationalism, as we saw, BirdLife International plays a great role, and all this idea of flyways, you, you give interesting references in your article, and I want to, ex to, to develop on, on that. Uh, uh, and, and Taiwan is actually a, a, an interesting actor in this transnational game, because due to the politics of China that excludes Taiwan from most of international uh, uh, representations, uh, such as uh, WHO, uh, they have to find other means of being international actors, and BirdLife International is one of the means. It's not, it's not a big um, uh, uh, international uh, organization like WHO, but it's still very active. And there's, there's a whole politics also of um, ecotourism, where they, 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 go, they, they, they have to find small states that would vote for Taiwan in, in big, in like, United Nations, so they, they find small, test, small states that have a species to defend, and they, they show that they can um, share their competencies in species uh, uh, defense uh, with, so that they call that eco-diplomacy, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's what they do with, with Israel, but it's interesting oh. also to think of the, of, of the uh, geopolitics uh, of uh, species conservation for small states uh, like Taiwan or Israel that have this kind of sentinel position in, in, in more geopolitical, in bigger geopolitical maps. And then on the question of uh, bending and democratization, I'm very interested by, by your analysis because uh, uh, um, sociologists in France have worked on this citizen science program and they, they are very critical about the fact that citizens are enrolled as data providers uh, and, and complain about losing their competencies. And what I found in Taiwan is that the, these uh, local bird watchers who were trained as benders, uh, and not as ringers, yeah. as you <laughs> say, um, uh, actually said that it was, the f it was the first contact with birds because they had to catch the bird and uh, <coughs> care for the way to handle it and then release it. So there was this physical contact with birds that is apparently lost for the citizens who's who do this kind of um, nature watch uh, programs, uh, uh, counting birds in their environment, but don't have the, the physical contact with birds. So it may be the, one of the sources of uh, democratization, this pending program. Okay, yes, Yves. Um, so just to mention, I, I, um, I read somewhere that uh, International Bird, or the, that the organization is the first, um, had the first listing mm -hmm. of Project actually before the IUCN, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there is an interesting connection between listing and uh, bird, bird watching. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. there is a making of a list. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think just uh, the act uh, of listing is, is an, it creates a, an interesting kind of bridge between, <laughs> um, you know, my paper before and, and, and your work. And actually, the people that I interviewed, most of them come from the bird, bird world. Mm -hmm. These are the people who have created the Red List. I think a lot of the knowledge, the way of thinking of ornithologists, um, not necessarily bird watchers, you know, I, I mm. kind of, I, I don't know uh, so much about that distinction, but um, it is very prominent in, the, um, in this, in this uh, Red Listing project. So interesting mm. maybe to reflect on mm -hmm. those commonalities. Now, the other thing is I thought it was very interesting, you'll see, um, to hear your uh, presentation um, you know, as a person who grew up with uh, learning about Birds of Israel, you have been, you know, the legend. I don't know, Frederick, if you know this is like the legendary <laughs> birder of Israel. So, um, you, you know, kind of uh, pro pro invoking or provoking this connection between militarism and conservation, which is something that I've been dealing with in a different context in um, Vieques and Culebra in Puerto Rico, where actually when the military pulled out, when the Navy pulled out, say from Vieques finally, um, then uh, the, the island has become a conservation, a, a, ref, uh, a, a national refuge. And so the link between the federal government, the military side of it, and then giving it to conservation uh, was a really interesting political link um, of what happened. And that was what I explored because yes, like you'll see you were saying, military causes in a way destruction we want to 
you know, affect them so they cause less destruction. But on the other hand, when there's military, in a way there's less humans. So the bombs that the Navy dropped in the corals mm -hmm. have actually pro, uh, 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 limited access to humans, and then the corals were actually preserved, right? Now, uh, the, the Navy left, um, Vietes, uh, the Vietnamese want to actually go there, but now there's bombs there, so what do you do? Do you bomb the corals and destroy the corals, or do you allow, uh, 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 to, to allow human access, or do you keep the bombs with the corals and no humans are allowed? So that was, I think this relationship between military and conservation is, is a, an important one, especially, well, in the Israeli context, it's very highlighted, um, where there's closed military zones is sometimes a place where, where uh, where different uh, species can actually proliferate, um, and then what what happens when 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 uh, what is the what is the close interrelations between the military and conservation um, um, uh, kind of um, uh, how would you say it like departments within the government? Mm -hmm. You know these these are different. So, so they seem like they're almost contradictory or, or extended contrast, but there's a lot of connections. Mm -hmm. and so it's something that uh, I'd love to hear what you think about that, especially. Can you answer briefly on these two points? Uh, do we have any more? Uh, I think you have a question. I want, yes, because I want to ask something that relates to uh, your first uh, uh, point about the connection between the two papers. And it seems to me, when reading your article uh, and hearing uh, Professor Lesham, that uh, bird watching is much more than bird watching. It actually seems to work some kind of some metaphor about many concepts that are very, very uh, loaded with political meaning uh, and even social meaning uh, uh, and uh, demography, migration threats, uh, borders, and even in our era of uh, terror threats, we don't know where, where, do we, mm -hmm. where the risk is. And it seems to me that, uh, well, in uh, Professor Lesham, the it was very obvious that we speak more, that birds can, uh, that the shared uh, interest in birds can lead to political collaborations and mm -hmm and to, uh, to many to much more than that uh, but in your uh, paper you drew on the on the lexicon of sentinels borders and I wanted to ask you could you do that with another species not okay. birds or do birds or, in, or the status the role of birds in the world of uh, Preservation as a special uh, status. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so I think that yeah. relates to. Yeah, that, that's Professor Bergman, and you could. That's the, 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 the anthropological question that I yeah. was thinking a lot about. And maybe I will answer that by answering the two previous mm -hmm. points. Um, so, on, on, on listing. Uh, it seems that in the history of uh, ornithology, the first lists of birds were built by naturalists coming from <coughs> new worlds and, and bringing back to the West this list of never seen birds mm -hmm. with like fancy colonial. feathers. So it, yeah, there was this colonial imperial idea of building a map of the diversity of the world. And at the same time, there was this rediscovery of nature by British uh, elite, and so the idea that you should m build a map of your local patch, and and so there was this this <coughs> double movement of having a global map and and checking that in your local environment you would see as many birds and sometimes new birds coming and sometimes others disappearing and. And, and so th that's the practice called ticking, uh, ticking the boxes of your list. And now they, they are bird watchers who do that at a global level. So there is this challenge of seeing the 8,000 species of the world. Uh, and and you, you need to be very rich to travel uh, 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 all uh, on the globe to, to do that. And visuality is so important. And visuality, visuality and hearing also. Mm -hmm. yeah, because many birds you can't see. So I think that the, the birds have this 
dialectic of absence and presence that you don't find in other uh, species. Some mammal species in the wild are very difficult to see. Domestic mammals are too easy to see, whereas birds are here and there. Um, um, and so it, it, that's why they are, they, they are interesting for producing meaning in science. And as for the relation between military and, and conservation, uh, so the, the next field work I want to do next October is um, uh, a territory uh, um, just next to Siamen, which is one of the uh, big um, free zones uh, of uh, the Chinese reform movement that has turned into a, a very big developmental, developmental uh, uh, city. And it's also a former colony uh, where there was a lot of bird watching in the uh, 17th, 18th century. <coughs> and so Xiamen is a Chinese city, and uh, on the other side of Xiamen is Qingmen, which is a Taiwanese island. But it was a, it was a military yeah, yeah. it was a military patrol. Um, it was the only uh, place in Taiwan that received bombs from the Chinese from the Chinese Popular Army, because it, it's it's really that there are two kilometers between the two uh, uh, islands, and uh, because Xiamen uh, has, has has developed so much. Uh, now all the bird species that were observed by the first Western naturalists have disappeared, but you can still see them in Kingman. And now there's a project of a highway connecting the two as a sign of the re good relations between China and Taiwan. So the bird watchers in, Ty in uh, Kingman and Chairman are, uh, are building an alliance to protect uh, Kingman, which is also a place of heritage with Hakka. So, so it's, it's going to be a very interesting uh, field work because the, it's the idea of, a, of an empty space because of military reasons. So how to convert a military patrol into uh, a space for conservation? And there's the, the same kind of issue in um, in Korea with the demilitarized the zone, yeah, the thirteenth uh, parallel DMZ zone, DMZ zone, yeah, uh, which is which is a uh, 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 heaven for biodiversity, uh, and so it's also the idea of, the, of this empty, empty land. Yes, Professor Lachem. Very briefly, first of all, very interesting that most of the the bird watchers they are amateurs, they are not professionals. You know, these are people that's their hobby, but they are very committed to their hobby. That's one point. Second, very interesting point is that most of them are males. No, no. They, now they are more more females, but for many years they are more mainly males, which okay. looks strange. Because you know the birds are flying, they are singing, they are colorful. You would you would suspect that it will be at least half and half, but there was several papers about that that it was, and that's coming to the point that they, they like to collect species, they like to count, they like to, to they make competition who sees more birds or rarest birds, and this is probably because it, the 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 bird the bird watching is the gene that former. Uh, Males were hunters, and the hunting is a gene of males and not in females. So now birding is the hunting, but is out killing the bird. They hunt them by the binocular, they hunt them by the telescope, and by the camera. But they are competing all the time, who will see more, and the, so, so, and so on. They shoot photos. Yeah, they shoot mm -hmm. photos, exactly. That's one for that, so, but it, it's a very, very committed community. And you can see that, as I said already, 100 million birds, if you look how many amphibian lovers you have in the world, you don't have maybe more than 100,000 or so, yeah. because birds are getting your soul. Talking on the contacts with that, I just, I thought so grim yeah. Just I want to show you with the project with the owls, you know, with our owl project, look at that. We, after we worked for, for, for three decades also, we went to the army, they gave us 2,000 ammunition boxes, mm -hmm. and you know the prophet Isaiah, they shall beat the swords uh, into plowshares. They gave us 2,000 ammunition boxes, and we converted them with soldiers to nesting boxes. And you see, we have now um, owls nesting in army boxes. You see, it's again another message, which is, of course, uh, very important for us when you talk to the army and you want to educate them. Huh? No, no, no the, this, is the, this is a water tower, and we have we have a web camera in the water tower but again to get the public connected uh, to the connected to the to the birds, and you see they can see it online. Okay, anyway. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this uh, panel. Okay.